Okay. Good. Hmm. Let's get moving. We have so many pages to cover. We have so, so little time. It's always like this. Uh, life, and then suddenly you die in the middle of the uh, sutta. Yeah, this is, this is how it goes usually. <laughs> so, let us uh, see what happens next. So, we have just seen uh, Sampati asking the Buddha. The Buddha has accepted. And now, what happens next is the following. I considered thus. To whom should I first teach the Dhamma? Who will understand the Dhamma quickly? Eh, then occurred to me, Alara Kalama is wise, intelligent and discerning. He has long had little dust in his eyes. Suppose I taught the Dhamma first to Alara Kalama. He will understand it quickly. Then the deities approached me and said, Venerable Sir, Alara Kalama died seven days ago. And the knowledge and vision arose in me, Alara Kalama died seven days ago. I thought Alara Kalama's loss is a great one. If, I, if he had heard this Dhamma, he would have understood it quickly. It's kind of interesting here how the Buddha, he, I guess he takes the people who are most obvious. Yeah, Alara Kalama is an obvious one because he had very profound meditation, uh, so he's a natural one. But also, I think one of the points is also that uh, he has a sense of gratitude, probably, to an old teacher. Uh, and this is what we see further down. Uh, we see that the Buddha actually is acting out of gratitude when it comes to teaching the group of five monks. Yeah, it's kind of nice. The, the Buddha is, uh, again, he is very much like the rest of us, but he is he's wise, he uses uh, these things with the highest degree of wisdom. Uh, so gratitude is something that he acts upon. Uh. I consider thus, to whom should I first teach the Dhamma? Who will understand it quickly? Uh, it occurred to me, Uddhaka Ramaputta is wise, intelligent and discerning. Uh, he has long had little dust in his eyes. Uh, dust basically means defilements. Uh. Suppose I taught the Dhamma first to Uddhaka Ramaputta. He will understand it quickly. Then the deities approached me and said, Venerable Sir, Uddhaka Ramaputta died last night. And the knowledge and vision arose in me. Uddhaka Ramaputta died last night. I thought Uddhaka Ramaputta's loss is a great one. He, if he had heard this Dhamma, he would have understood it quickly. I considered thus, to whom should I first teach the Dhamma? Who will understand it quickly? It occurred to me, the group of five who attended upon me while I was engaged in my striving were very helpful. Suppose I taught the Dhamma first to them. Then I thought, where are the bhikkhus of the group of five living now? And with a divine eye which is purified and surpasses the human, I saw that they were living at Benares in the, uh, uh, in the deer park at Isipatana. This is Saranat, yeah? this is where Saranat is today, and that's where you, uh, what this is all about. So he knew that they were there, maybe he, they had told him that that's where they were going, maybe that was why he knew, I don't know. But this is uh, how the story goes. So, uh, then he has decided what to do next, and then this is what happens. Then because when I had stayed at Uruvela as long as I chose, I set out to wander by stages uh, to Benares, between Gaya and the place of enlightenment, that's what it's called here, the place of enlightenment, that's what Gaya now. Uh, the Ajivaka up Upaka saw me on the road and said, friend, your faculties are clear, the color of your skin is pure and bright. Under whom have you gone forth, friend? Who is your teacher? Whose Dhamma do you profess or do you, you know, teach? And then he replies to Upaka. So this is um, one of the things that you can expect when you reach a profound stage of understanding or samadhi. Your faculties are clear. Here the faculties probably means the sense faculties. You look someone in the eye and they look like the eyes are clear, you know, something like that. Uh, and they kind of have a kind of peaceful demeanor and all of these kind of things. The faculties are clear. Uh, the color of your skin is pure and bright. And of course, the point here is that your mental state will have effect on the physical characteristics of a person. Uh, 
Uh, the mind is so powerful that sometimes your, your mind, w uh, your, your skin or your complexion will actually uh, change as a consequence of the content of your mind. And I think that is probably quite possible. I don't see why that shouldn't be the case. Uh, and uh, the Buddha says in the Mahapanibbana Sutta, there's two occasions when the skin becomes particularly bright of a Buddha at the moment uh, just after his awakening and just before his Parinibbana when he passes away and two very special occasions. So, so I think that might, might actually be, be true. I don't know if that is necessarily so super normal. Uh, so, and then, so he asks him, well, he's obviously very impressed by the Buddha. I don't know if you know, there is a sutta somewhere which says that just seeing an arahant in the world is a great benefit. And the reason that is a such benefit is when you see someone like that, you know that there's something special going on. Yeah, when you meet an arahant, when you meet someone who is really peaceful, who is extraordinarily kind, you know that there's something about them which is different from ordinary people. Uh, and that inspires confidence, uh, inspires faith. Uh, you get this feeling that there is some pro something profound in this, this universe uh, that is available to each one of us. Uh, this person has found it. Uh, yeah, so just seeing that actually is already, uh, uh, suddenly you know that the, the life doesn't have to be just ordinary. Uh, you don't just have to have the ordinary sufferings. Uh, there is something more profound possible in this life. Uh. So that is one of the advantages of seeing the Buddha or seeing an Arahant, yeah? And you see that happening right here. Upaka, now is his chance. He has met the Buddha. He's the first person in the world who's met the Buddha, yeah? Do you th do you th what do you think happens? Do you think he takes his chance? <laughs> this is the funny thing, yeah? Because you know the sutta already, so you know what's happening next. Uh, here you are, face to face with the Buddha. It's this massive opportunity to get it right, to become enlightened, to become all the happiness in the world. But what happens next is not so encouraging. So we will see what happens next. Uh, I replied to uh, the Ajivaka Upaka in verses. Uh, I am one who has transcended all, a knower of all, unsullied among all things, renouncing all. Uh, I am freed by cravings cessation. Uh, Having known this all for myself, to whom should I point as a teacher? I have no teacher, and one like me exists nowhere in all the world, with all its gods, because I have no person for my counterpart. I am the accomplished one in the world, I am the teacher supreme. I alone am fully awakened one, whose fires are quenched and extinguished. I go now to the city of Kasi, to Varanasi, to set in motion the wheel of the Dhamma. In a world that has become blind, I go to beat the drum of the deathless. <laughs> Imagine you meet someone on the street and they say that to you. <laughs> oh. <laughs> That'd be scary, it'd almost be scary, wouldn't it, if someone if we can, oh. So you can sort of... Uh, I, you know, can, maybe you can, maybe we can forgive Upaka for being a little bit, uh, uh, you know, scared perhaps or whatever. <laughs> so then Upaka says, he, Upaka replies, by your claims, friend, you ought to be the universal victor. The, and then Buddha says, the victors are those like me who have won the destruction of the asavas, the taints. I have vanquished all bad qualities, therefore, Upaka, I am a victor. And then, <laughs> then, when this was said, the Ajivaka Upaka said, May it be so, friend, and shaking his, his head, he took a bypath and departed. <laughs> oh, that, that's pr what a miss, yeah, what a oppor wasted opportunity. <laughs> And, and the word for bypath here, I think the Pali is kumaga, is that right? Umaga. Kumaga, yeah. Umaga, umaga, okay. Umaga, kumaga, okay. So these are two words, basically means the wrong path. Yeah, he took a wrong path. It's like a metaphor for he, he basically lost the opportunity uh, and now he was continuing on as an Ajivaka. There's many ways of uh, understanding this. Very often, if you are already a disciple of another sect, it's hard to change your view. You already have your strong views. Uh, uh, maybe the Buddha was a little bit too strong. Maybe he wasn't used to teaching yet. Maybe he didn't know exactly what was the right approach. Yeah, maybe. 
You know, sometimes we think that the Buddha is perfect in all ways, but remember that the perfection of the Buddha is really the perfection of insight. He may not really have fully known how to approach teaching yet. It may have taken some time before he knew that. So um, this is a possibility. But uh, anyway, Upaka, he lost the opportunity. And what is interesting about this, you know, sometimes I hear Buddhists say, oh, the Dhamma is lost in our present society. No one is enlightened anymore. It's impossible to get enlightened now. I am going to wait for the future Buddha, Buddha Maitreya. <laughs> and of course, when Buddha Maitreya comes around, what happens? We, we are going to be like Upaka, yeah? We're going to be, like, oh, we see the Buddha, and then we take the wrong path. Yeah, how do we know that we will recognize the Buddha when he comes around next time? We have no idea. How do we know we will be reborn as humans? We have no idea. Maybe we will get reborn in Norway or Malaysia and the Buddha is in India. Yeah, and there's no way to get across because... <laughs> so there's so many uncertainties and the idea that we can wait for Buddha Maitreya is just really a silly one. And I really encourage you not to take such ideas seriously because you have no idea what's going to happen. Buddha Maitreya could be a long time in the future. There may not even be a Buddha Maitreya. The, the, the whole word Maitreya is almost also like a legendary word. There will probably be future Buddhas, but whether it will be this particular Buddha Maitreya or whatever, we just don't know. We don't know when it's going to be here. All of that is uncertain. With so many uncertainties, there's only one right way of practicing. Now is the opportunity. And you may feel that you have learned a lot from Buddhism in this life, and you probably have, but you could lose that again in the meantime. Yeah, wisdom, wisdom like everything else, is subject to fluctuations. Yeah, so by, by next time, when the Buddha comes around, you may be a committed Christian. Yeah, you may have lost all, your, lost all the Buddha's wisdom, now you are a Christian instead, or maybe you are an atheist, I don't know what, what, you, what we could be next time around. And then you hold on, no, I believe in God, I don't want to hear this, this nonsense about non-self, yeah? And then you are attached to that view, and then there's no chance. So there are so many uncertainties, it's so, you know, so unreliable whether we actually will meet the next Buddha or whatever, now is the opportunity. And I always have considered it slightly disrespectful to our Buddha, our Buddha Gautama, who gave us all these teachings, he gave us all of this. And we have, here we are, we have the path on the plat, on the plate, all we have to do is to uh, you know, use it and get going and, and actually achieve some of these things. And then we say, no, I'm going to wait for the next Buddha. It's almost like a, a slightly disrespectful to the present Buddha. He is our teacher, he is the one who has given us all this. Instead, we go worshipping some pie in the sky that we don't know anything about. It's madness when you think about it. It, uh, and um, you know some of these sects. I don't know if you have them here in in Malaysia. There's a sect called the Ikuan Tao. Have you heard about that Ikuan Tao? Yeah, and it's a sect that arose in China about a century ago, and now it is big in Taiwan, and it's kind of carrying around. And in the biggest, one of the biggest Ikuan Tao temples in. Uh, uh, Southeast Asia is found in Medan. Medan is not far from here, yeah, just around across the strait uh, of Malacca, and then you have the you have the Medan. Well, it's an enormous temple. I, I saw it when I was in Medan recently. I was there. It's an enormous thing. Yeah. Most, one of the most expensive temples in uh, I don't know how it cost half a billion dollars, something like that, something crazy. Yeah. And what do they do? One of the main things they do is worshiping Maitreya. That's one of the main things. Yeah, this is what it's kind of based on. Uh, it's like a uh, what I would consider a, a degenerate form of Buddhism. It's not real Buddhism anymore. And this is very common, not just in Ikuan Tao, but also in large parts of more, more common, more mainstream Buddhist communities. Uh, I think it's so important to uh, leave that to one side and come back to the real path uh, and not end up like Upaka. Yeah? And otherwise we might, we might all be little Upakas and then we, we, have, a, we have a problem. Uh. Okay. So, then uh, the Buddha continues, then because wandering by stages, I eventually came to Benares, to the deer park in Isipatana, and I approached the bhikkhus of the group of five. The bhikkhus saw me coming in the distance, and they agreed among themselves thus. Friends, here comes the recluse Gotama, who lives luxuriously, who has given up his striving and reverted to luxury. We should not pay homage to him, or rise up for him, or receive his ball and outer robe. But a seat may be prepared for him. If he likes, he may sit down. <laughs> 
However, as I approached, those bhikkhus found themselves unable to keep their pact. One came to meet me and took my bowl and outer robe. Another prepared a seat, and another set out water for my feet. However, they addressed me by name and as friend. And this is, uh, again, you see here the idea is that uh, uh, when someone reaches awakening, there is something very powerful about them. Uh, yeah, when you get into their presence, you get this, you cannot stop yourself, even though you have made a pact not to go out and meet him, you can't stop yourself, because the power of the Buddha is so tangible, it's like it f pervades the space, and you feel drawn towards a, a person like that. Uh, like a mother, like a calf gets drawn to her mother cow, in the same way you are drawn to the Buddha, because the qualities are so strong and so powerful. Uh, but still, they call him by name and as friend. And the, you should not supposed to call the Buddha like, by friend. Yeah, oh, friend, friend Buddha doesn't <laughs> doesn't <laughs> doesn't sound right. That's a bit, little bit too familiar. <laughs> Thereupon, I told them, bhikkhus, do not address the Tathagata by name and as friend. The Tathagata is an accomplished one, a fully enlightened one. Listen, because the deathless has been attained, I shall instruct you, I shall teach you the Dhamma, practicing as you are instructed, by realizing for yourself here and now, through direct knowledge, you will soon enter upon and abide in that supreme goal of the holy life, for the sake of which clansmen rightly go forth from the home life into homelessness. When this was said, the bhikkhus of the group of five answered me thus, Friend Gautama, by the conduct, the practice, and the performance of austerities that you undertook, you did not achieve any superhuman qualities and a distinction in knowledge and vision worthy of the noble ones. Since you now live luxuriously, having given up your striving and reverted to luxury, uh, how will you have achieved any superhuman qualities and a distinction in knowledge and vision worthy of the noble ones? In other words, they're saying, well, the only way to achieve noble qualities is by, uh, by asceticism. That's the only way. Yeah, there is no other way. So if you give up that, how, how could you possibly achieve anything? Yeah. When this was said, I told them that the target does not live luxuriously, yeah, nor has he given up his striving and reverted to luxury. Yeah. The target is an accomplished one, a fully awakened one. Yeah. Listen, because the deathless has been attained, and he repeats what he said before, uh, and you will go for, and go forward from home into homelessness. Uh, a second time, the bhikkhu said the same thing to me. How can you attain this when you revert to luxury? A second time, I told them he does not. Uh, the target does not live luxuriously. A third time, they said the same thing. And then, when this was said, I asked them, bhikkhu, have you ever known me to speak like this before? No, Venerable Sir. Suddenly they have changed their tone. Now they call him Venerable Sir, Bhante. Because the Tathagata is an accomplished one, a fully enlightened one. Listen, because the deathless has been attained. I shall instruct you. I shall teach you the Dhamma, practicing as you are instructed, by realizing for yourselves here and now through direct knowledge, you will soon enter upon and abide in that supreme goal of the holy life for the sake of which clansmen rightly go forth from the home life into homelessness. I was able to convince the bhikkhus of the group of five. Then I sometimes instructed two bhikkhus while the other three went for arms and the six of us lived on what those three bhikkhus brought back from the arms round. Sometimes I instructed three bhikkhus while the other two went for arms and the six of us lived on what those two bhikkhus brought back from arms round. Then the bhikkhus of the group of five thus taught and instructed by me being themselves subject to birth, uh, having understood the danger in what is subject to birth, uh, seeking the freedom from birth, the supreme uh, rest from exertion, extinguishment, attained just that. Uh, and uh, uh, being themselves subject to old age, to sickness, to death, to sorrow, to defilements, uh, having understood a dan the danger in all of these things, uh, they attained uh, this 
they at, eventually they attained that uh, uh, freedom from old age, from sickness, from death, from sorrow, and from defilement, uh, the supreme rest from exertion, extinguishment. Uh, the knowledge and vision arose in them. Uh, our deliverance is unshakable. Uh, this is our last birth. Uh, there is no renewal of being. Uh, so that is how the Dhamma got going. That was the beginning of the Sangha uh, when the f group of five bhikkhus uh, finally uh, made that attainment and they also become arahants, then the Sangha was established in the world. Uh, so first of all you had the Buddha arising, from the Buddha comes the Dhamma, the teaching, and from the Dhamma and Buddha comes the Sangha, one thing arising after the other. And there you have then the triple gem existing in the world. Uh, Okay, so um, that is uh, that story of the Buddha, how his awakening happens and then how things kind of uh, develop from there. Now, uh, let us, is there any questions about that before I carry on? Is, is everyone happy with that? Are you not happy with that? <laughs> You're not happy with that? Okay. <laughs> okay, weigh in, please. <laughs> um, Venerable Sir, Ananna, the deadless one, yeah. is that an epithet for the Buddha? Or is it just used in this verse? Uh, the death? Uh, the deadless, deadless. Deadless one, deadless one, okay. Um, Yes, I think it, it is found somewhere in the suttas. The idea is that as long as you are eating the arms of the country, but you haven't become an arahant yet, you have a debt to the world, because people feed you to practice. And as long as you haven't reached the goal of the practice, like you have a debt to the people who feed you. But once you become an arahant, you have, you have, you have paid back your debt, because you have found the purpose for which that arms was given to you in the first place. So you are debtless because of that. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Because I'm, I'm thinking of one sutta which I was, which has been playing in my head. Yeah. Uh, Anguttara uh, 640, uh, no, 462, I think. Yeah. Uh -huh. It's the deadless sutta. Okay. So the first one is Ati Sukha, then there's Boga Sutta, Anana Sukha is the third one. Okay. So I was wondering whether it means that's a different. Thing. Okay. Uh, that's different because in that case it just means the ordinary debt, like you have, you know, you you, have, you borrow money from a bank. No yeah? obligations. Yeah, you have no obligations anymore, exactly. So it means that you, as long as you have debt, you are kind of a bound, you are debt, you are uh, bound by the bank. The bank has you as a slave, yeah, and they can kind of do all kind of bad things to you. So not having a debt is a kind of happiness. That's why it's called the Anana Sukha. Yep. Yeah. And the first one, Ati Sukha, is that existence? Ati Bawa Sukha. It's like Bawa Sukha. Ati Sukha is that what it is? Yeah, it's Ati, A T T H I. Really? Yeah. The happiness of existence, the happiness of there is, maybe it's the happiness of uh, having enough property, Atisukha. The yeah, next one is Boga Sukha, exactly. the next one. Uh, the, the, yeah. the explanation is for yeah. Boga. Same thing here? Yeah, yeah for the in the Sutta, the explanation is for Boga, for Atisukha, and then Boga Sukha, there's more repetition on Boga. Right, um, yeah. So I was wondering whether it's Bawa. Uh, <laughs> it's a Ati, there is, there is happiness. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know about that one. I can't even remember that. Uh, you have, you know more about the suttas than I do. That's no. that's the problem. Uh. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Pante. <laughs> uh, yeah. Question. Um, any backgrounds of these five bhikkhus? I mean, they are not Sariputta or Mulagana. I mean, um, can you give us some background of these five bhikkhus that form the Sangha? Thank you. Uh, the background, again, there is very little information found in the suttas about them. I'm sure that there is a lot in the commentaries, but I don't really read the commentaries very much. I don't really know much about what's, <laughs> what's in there. Uh, but um, yeah, maybe they were friends from the time that when he was under Alara Kalama, perhaps, or maybe they were friends from an early point of view, someone who followed him around. Uh, he would have, the Buddha even before he became enlightened, he obviously would have been a very special person. Uh, and you can imagine that people would maybe kind of regard him as special and they would follow him, him around. Uh, but there's very little information about where they come from. But uh, later on, again, they also disappear. Uh, some of them are found later, like Asaji, he was one of the f 
five, Mahana, Asaji, Vappa, and Baddhya, the five, are not, uh, that's the kind of names they're usually given. And Asaji, one of the interesting things about him is that he is the one who meets Venerable Sariputta before Sariputta becomes a monk. You know that story? Yeah? That's a very nice story where uh, Venerable Sariputta and Mahamogalana, they are already friends. And they have this compact with each other that the one who finds the deathless the first has to tell the other one. Yeah? It's a kind of nice, nice thing to do, so you can do that with your friends. <laughs> <laughs> and then one day he is in the city in Rajagaha, this is in Rajagaha in Magadha, and he sees this monk who is very inspiring. And this monk is Venerable Asaji, one of the first five disciples. So Venerable Sariputta goes up to him and asks him, uh, you know, you know who, who, can you please teach me who is a teacher? Can you please te give me a teaching? And Asa said, oh, I'm, old, I'm new to this Dhamma, I, I don't know much. He's an Arahant already, right? <laughs> I'm new, I don't know very much. Oh, please, just, you know, don't need to say much, just say something very short and very brief. And then he says this line that everything that, has a, uh, that arises will cease. Yeah? Everything that has nature to arise will also cease. And what happens then? When Masari Putta becomes a stream enterer. It's, it's quite amazing, yeah? I mean, how many of you became a stream enterer just now? You just heard it. <laughs> Yeah, so you have to have really powerful faculties to be able to get that. Everything that has a nature to arise must cease. And at that moment you realize, what you realize, I think, there's nothing to hold on to in the world. Everything is just ephemeral, it always passes away, and then you let go at that moment. Probably because he was already an ascetic, he was already a practitioner, he probably had a good samadhi already. That's why he was able to do that. And that's the story of Asaji and, and Venerable Sariputta. And of course later on then he goes back to Mahamogalana, and then they become ordained, and they become the Buddha's chief disciples. But uh, there is very little information about the five. Apart from that, they don't not prominent anywhere. They may not have been very natural teachers. Maybe they just lived in the forest for themselves or didn't really have any prominent position. Um, again, there is no doubt. That probably you can find their verses in the... Have you read their verses in the Theragata? No, maybe look up their verses. They might be quite nice, uh, and they might say something about them. And they, they are probably some of the best information you can find about them. Uh, so go to Sutta Central. Have you been, you know Sutta Central? Uh, yeah, te you go to Sutta Central online. Sutta Central. Go to Teragata there and get the translation and and so get, get get the names out. Uh, yeah, there is a nice story about Badia. I don't know if it is the same Badia. There is another Badia who is in the Vinaya. I'm not sure if it is the same one. Could be the same one. Uncertain. And this is a story of Badia, and he's sitting in the forest at the root of a tree here, yeah, by himself. And uh, he is sitting there, and he says, he keeps on exclaiming, "Oh, aho sukang, aho sukang," which means, "Oh, what happiness! Oh, what happiness!" So he's sitting at the root of the tree, saying this all the time. And then uh, some groups of monks they kind of walk past and they see him sitting there, and they think. He must be going crazy. What is he doing, sitting at the root of a tree, saying this all the time? They get worried about him. So they go to the Buddha and they say, well, Badia, he is sitting at the root of a tree and he's just exclaiming, Aho Sukang, Aho Sukang, all the time. We think, he's, we think he's nuts. You know, Venerable Sir, please do something. And then so the Buddha says to a man who is there, he says to him, well, please go and get Badia. So he goes and gets Badia, Badia comes, and the Buddha says to him, well, is it true that you are just sitting by yourself in the forest at the root of a tree saying, Aho Sukang, Aho Sukang all the time? And Buddha says, yes, it's true. And then the Buddha says, well, why are you saying that? And it, Badia was one of the uh, sons of one of the very highest families in the Sakyan tribe. He was like a prince or something like that. Uh, and he was used to a lot of luxury, even more than the Buddha probably when he grew up. Uh, and then he says to the Buddha, well the reason why I'm sitting here is that when I think back to the life as a prince, I think about all the troubles, yeah, all the work, all the things I have to look after, all the wives I had, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah? And so many, so many things to look after. And now I'm free, I'm liberated. All I have to do is sit here at the root of a tree, do nothing. Aho Sukang, Aho Sukang. Yeah. It's a nice story because it gives you the contrast between the highest worldly happiness and the happiness of an arahant. Yeah? Happiness of arahant is just way beyond any happiness you can have in the world. The world that seems like a place of, of responsibilities and problems and cares, whereas the life gone forth on arahant is completely free. Could be the same badia. I don't know, but maybe it is the same badia. <laughs> anyway, so um, that is... Uh, a little bit about that. Uh, any other questions about 
Anything? Yes, Barbara. Yeah, Uh, Brahma, uh, coming back to Brahma, Sahampati, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, now it seems like the Hindus or whatever uh, seem to have a last say because they say Buddha is the reincarnation <laughs> of Vishnu. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. what is your comment? But uh, this, this is this is what I mean. This is a tip strategy of all religions. All religions have the same strategy. It is the idea of incorporating other religions into your own. Yeah. So the Hindus try to incorporate the Buddhism into theirs. We try to incorporate Hinduism into ours. Yeah. So we all try to appropriate the other people. Uh, so exactly, Buddha is the reincarnation of Shiva. Not only that, but uh, according to the Hindus, like Virgin Mary, she's one of the gods in the Hindus as well. Huh? So Christianity also a part of Hinduism. Yeah? This was one of the... We, we have a couple of Indian uh, people who are, who are becoming monks at our monastery. Uh, they come from India. And uh, one of them, he, is, uh, he comes from the south of India. Uh, was it him or was it the other one? I can't remember now. We have a couple of people, from, one from Bangladesh and one from India. They're both Hindus originally, but they become Buddhists. And they're really, uh, they, and hopefully they will become monks. They're really, really, really nice people. And they told me the story that uh, one of the family members had decided to marry a Christian. Yeah, and so they went to their mother and said, Oh, mother, do you mind if I marry a Christian? Oh, no problem, because Virgin Mary, she's already a Hindu. Yeah, So no, no, no problem with that. <laughs> So th this is this is how it works. Yeah, you include every, everything else into your your own religion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There is a documentary about that one, but I, I I don't know. I I have heard various comments on that documentary, and I think uh, many people say it is. Uh, so yeah, the documentary he was born in India, right? Yeah. You see, yeah, yeah. I know about that one. Huh? Yeah. Anyway, I don't want to get into that. I don't know enough about it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, sorry, Bhante. Yeah. Even in China, yeah. we were doing uh, the topic on how Buddhism went to China. <laughs> they even tried to say Menzi. Menzi is one of the famous philosophers. Yeah. They tried to create a story that Menzi, when he was born, he could also walk seven steps. Okay. And each step was at the lotus flower. Uh, right, okay. Yeah, and they yeah. printed and circulated this yeah. uh, story, you know. Yeah. And the Buddhists there were so angry, yeah. told the emperor to ban them from printing the, this kind of uh, information yeah. because it's not true, they say. <laughs> yeah, yeah it's, like, it's like that because you get competition between the religions. You know, it's, it's natural. Uh, nobody, if you, you know, you, you don't want your, your religion to be, lose out, so you want to do these things, yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, uh, so how? What time did we start? Uh, I can't remember now. Quarter, quarter two. Is that when we started? Uh, should we go a little bit longer? Uh, what? I can't. I've lost. I've lost my lost track of what I'm doing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Let's continue a little bit more because. Uh, so let's have a look at the next suit. Now this is called imperfections. So and this is just another nice little story about the Buddha. This is one of the uh, famous stories uh, uh, in the suttas and also in the Vinaya about something called the quarrel at Kosambi when the monks were arguing with each other. And this shows us how the Buddha kind of deals with that kind of situation. And it's quite, it's quite nice. And uh, so that's why I've take, uh, picked this one for just to get this feeling for the Buddha, who the Buddha was as a person. So let's have a look at this. Thus have I heard. On one occasion, the Blessed One was living at Kosambi in Gosita's Park. Now on that, or monastery probably better. Now on that occasion, the bhikkhus at Kosambi had taken to quarreling and brawling and were deep in disputes, stabbing each other with verbal daggers. Kind of nice expression, isn't it? Stabbing each other with verbal daggers. Then, a certain bhikkhu went to the Blessed One, and after paying homage to him, uh, he stood at one side and said, Venerable Sir, the bhikkhus here at Kosambi have taken to quarreling and brawling, uh, and are deep in disputes, stabbing each other with verbal daggers. Uh, it would be good, uh, Venerable Sir, if the Blessed One would go to those bhikkhus out of compassion. Uh, and the Blessed One consented by silence. Uh, then the Blessed One went to those bhikkhus and said to them, 
In Epicurus, let there be no quarrelling, brawling, wrangling or dispute. When this was said, a certain bhikkhu said to the Blessed One, Wait, Venerable Sir, let the Blessed One, the Lord of the Dhamma, live at ease, devoted to a pleasant abiding here and now. We are the ones who will be responsible for this quarrelling, brawling, wrangling and dispute. It is a it's not very, not very good thing to say in the presence of the Buddha. Instead of saying we will we will sort out and stop quarrelling, you say we want to continue our quarrels. Please don't get involved. That's what he's saying to the Buddha, basically. So uh, not really the right attitude. The second time and the third time, the Blessed One said, "Enough, Bhikkhus. Let there be no quarrelling, brawling, wrangling, and dispute." And for the third time, that bhikkhu said to the Blessed One, Wait, Venerable Sir, we are the ones who will be responsible for this quarreling, brawling, wrangling and dispute. Then, when it was morning, the Blessed One uh, robed up and t took his bowl and outer robe. He entered Kosambi for arms. When he had wandered for arms in Kosambi and had returned from his arms round, after his meal he set his resting place in order, took his bowl and outer robe, and while standing he uttered these uh, verses. So the Buddha has basically given up on these monks, Yeah, he can't make them listen to him, and that is when he utters these verses because of that. When many voices shout at once, None considers himself a fool. Though the Sangha is being split, none thinks himself to be at fault. They have forgotten thoughtful speech. They talk obsessed by words alone. Uncurbed their mouths, they bawl at will. None knows what leads him so to act. He abused me, he struck me, he defeated me, he robbed me. In those who harbour thoughts like these, hatred will never be allayed. He abused me, he struck me, he defeated me, he robbed me. In those who do not harbour thoughts like these, hatred will readily be allayed. For in this world, hatred is never allayed by further acts of hate. It is allayed by non-hatred. This is a fixed and ageless law. Those others do not recognize that here we should restrain ourselves, but those wise ones who realize this at once end all their enmity. Breakers of bones and murderers, those who steal cattle, horses and wealth, those who pillage the entire realm, when even these can act together, why can you not do so too? If one can find a worthy friend, a virtuous, steadfast companion, then overcome all threats and danger, and walk with him, content and mindful. But if one finds no worthy friend and no virtuous steadfast companion, then as a king leaves his conquered realm, walk like a tusker in the woods alone. Tusker is like an elephant. Better it is to walk alone. There is no companionship with fools. Walk alone and do no evil at ease like a tusker in the woods. So these are very famous verses. You will probably recognize many of these verses. Yeah, I, I'm not going to comment too much on them because I think they are reasonably self-explanatory. They're very beautiful and they have been translated here quite nicely into English. Even the English is quite poetic in many ways. Uh, but the, for example, the, verse, the third verse there, they abused me, he struck me, he defeated me, he robbed me. Uh, and, and the next two verses after that, that's from the Dhammapada. You may recognize that. Uh, and uh, so these are found, this is the verse number two, uh, three, four, and five, I think, in the Dhammapada. Five, three, four, and five, I think it is. Um, and, um, uh, and very beautiful little things, yeah, when you, when you read that. Uh, these are kind of the sort of things that makes the Dhammapada so beautiful. Uh, all you have to do sometimes is to read a little verse like that, at night before you go to bed or something, and already you feel better, yeah, you, after a long and tiring day, and just something to kind of lift your spirits a little bit. 
very famous verses. And very often the verses are found both in the suttas, but also often in the verse collections, Dhammapada, but also here in the Majjhima Nikaya at the same time. Uh, they're kind of crossed over between the various collections. Uh, and then also the next one, others recognize you should restrain ourselves. I think that too is from the Dhammapada uh, and some of the six, is it? Okay. And some of these other ones here too, I, I can't remember now exactly where they are from, but uh, some of them are from the Dhammapada, some are not. Uh, so this is what the Buddha has to say, and this may very well have been original. So we can see here the Buddha is saying, now is the time to go. These monks are fools, so they won't listen, so I'm going to leave. That's basically what he's saying here. I'm going to be like the Tusker elephant who walks in the woods alone. Then, having uttered these verses while standing, the Buddha, a blessed one, went to the village of Bala Kalonakara. On that occasion, the venerable Bhagu was living at the village of Bala uh, Balakalonakara. When the venerable Bhagu saw the Blessed One coming in the distance, uh, he prepared a seat and set out water for washing the feet. Uh, the Blessed One sat down on the seat made ready and washed his feet. The venerable Bhagu paid homage to the Blessed One and sat down to one side. And the Blessed One said to him, uh, I hope you're keeping well, Bhikkhu. I hope you're comfortable. I hope you're not having any trouble getting alms food. I am keeping well, blessed one, I am comfortable, I am not having any trouble getting alms food. This is the way that the Buddha often speaks to his monks. Yeah, often very, he kind of makes sure he is like a teacher who makes sure that they are well, they are comfortable. Like a father almost to the uh, bhikkhu sangha and maybe slightly also for the bhikkhu sangha as well. Then the Blessed One instructed, urged, roused and gladdened the Venerable Bhagu with talk on the Dhamma, after which he rose from his seat and went to the eastern bamboo park. So uh, this is typically what the Buddha would do. He would uh, go out to meet his monks uh, and then uh, inspire them with the Dhamma talk. Now on that occasion the Venerable Anuruddha, who was the Buddha's cousin, the Venerable Nandiya and Venerable Kimbala, who I think also were Sakyans, uh, were living at the eastern bamboo uh, monastery. The park keeper saw the Blessed One coming in the distance and told him, do not enter this park, recluse. There are three clansmen here seeking their own good. Do not disturb them. He obviously has no idea who the Buddha is, yeah, obviously completely clueless. And again, it shows you that the Buddha pretty much looked like any other monk. There was nothing kind of special about him. And here the park keeper tries to keep him out. The Venerable Anuruddha heard the park keeper speaking to the Blessed One and told him, Friend park keeper, do not keep the Blessed One out. It is our teacher, the Blessed One, who has come. Then the Venerable Anuruddha went to the Venerable Nandiya and the Venerable Kimbila and said, Come out, Venerable Sirs, come out. Our teacher, teacher, the Blessed One, has come. Then all three went to meet the Blessed One. One took his bowl and outer robe, one prepared a seat, and one set out wash water for washing the feet. The Blessed One sat down on the seat, made ready, and washed his feet. Again, you can see how the Blessed One always is washing his own feet in these uh, stories. Uh, then those three venerable ones paid homage to the Blessed One and sat down at one side. And the Blessed One said to them, I hope you're all keeping well, Anuruddha, or Anuruddhas, is it plural? Plural there, I think. I hope you are comfortable, yeah? Uh, I hope you are not having any trouble getting alms food. We are keeping well, Blessed One, we are comfortable, and we are not having any trouble getting alms food. There's a small point there, it's interesting, the Buddha speaks to them as Anuruddha, but he uses the word Anuruddha in the plural. So he says Anuruddhas, as if they're all called Anuruddha. Yeah, but they're not, because one is called Kimbala, one is called Nandia. So he, but he's addressing them in this way, and this is quite interesting, because what it means is that uh, very often uh, the people who the Buddha addresses are the most senior people in the assembly. Uh, so very often the most senior ones will be the bhikkhus, because the bhikkhus were ordained first, the bhikkhu sangha was established first. Uh, so usually when the Buddha addresses the bhikkhus, uh, it does not mean that there is no one else in the assembly. Uh, 
Very often there may have been bhikkhunis there. Uh, very often there may have been lay people present in these assemblies. Yeah. So remember that. So very often when you read the suttas, you get the feeling that the Buddha is always speaking to the monks. But actually, that may not be the case. There may have been a much larger assembly present. It's just that the monks were the most senior, and that's why he addresses them. So you are included too. Yeah? When the Buddha speaks, you're not excluded. Just because you're not a bhikkhu doesn't mean you are excluded. And so keep that in mind when you read these suttas. I hope, Anuruddha, that you are living in concord with mutual appreciation without disputing, blending like milk and water. Not like milk and oil, but like milk, no, not like water and oil, but like milk and water. Viewing each other with kindly eyes. Surely, Venerable Sir, we are living in concord with mutual appreciation without disputing, blending like milk and water, viewing each other with kindly eyes. But Anuruddha, how do you live thus? Venerable Sir, as to that, I think thus. It is a gain for me, it is a great gain for me that I am living with such companions. In the holy life, the Brahmacharya, I maintain bodily acts of metta, of loving kindness towards these venerable ones, both openly and privately. I maintain verbal acts of loving-kindness towards them both openly and privately. I maintain mental acts of loving-kindness towards them both openly and privately. I consider, why should I not set aside what I wish to do and do what these venerable ones wish to do? Then I set aside what I wish to do and do what these venerable ones wish to do. We are different in body, venerable sir, but one in mind. This is how you live in harmony. Yeah, so remember that. It's very, this is a very nice little summary of how to live in harmony. And uh, it is always the case that in all organizations, and I'm sure it is true at, here at the BGF as well, it is not always 100% harmonious. Isn't that right? It's very difficult to always have complete harmony. It is true, it's also true in the Buddha Society of WA is true in Bodhinana Monastery. Yeah, I, I feel a bit embarrassed at saying that, but it's true. It's not ho always 100% harmony. Sometimes little things happen. It's actually pretty good at Bodhinana Monastery, but uh, sometimes it is not uh, you know, I absolutely ideal. And this is the way to do it. Uh, the way to do it is to have metta for the people around you, for the people you have to deal with, especially for the people you have to deal with. Uh, have metta for your family members, uh, have metta for the people you work with, uh, and metta for the people uh, who you are part with here at the BGF. And uh, when, you do, when you do have metta in that way, it becomes very harmonious as a consequence. Of course, the hard thing is to actually always have metta, that's the hard part, but if you can do it, that is how it comes about. And remember, what is nice about this is that you, the way you practice metta is always by doing it first, by body and by speech. That's where you start. You don't start with sitting down, you know, closing your eyes, may all beings be happy and well. Because that is, first of all, it's often a little bit too theoretical. And secondly, it is something that really needs to be developed after you develop the more basic aspects of metta. It starts with our actions in body and speech. So make sure you treat the people around you well. Yeah, one of the nice things about coming to a place like this and coming together with like-minded people, everyone here, is that when you are together with people from the BGF, who come on a retreat, who listen to the Dhamma, who do meditation practice, uh, you know that the qualities of everyone here are so good, uh, so positive. You know that already. Bad people don't come to places like this. Uh, what's the point of coming listening to this Dhamma teaching if you're bad? If you are evil, there's no point. Uh, or, or is that true? Uh, or is there anyone who is really evil in here? If you're really evil, let, please let me know. But uh, it's not the case, yeah? So because that's the whole point of being here, is the point that you uh, want to develop yourself, you want to learn something about uh, the good things in life. So remember that. Uh, the people around you who are part of an organization like this are really good people. Uh, they are trying their very best. Uh, they're not perfect. Sometimes they will do things that irritate you. But remember the big picture. Uh, remember the good qualities that are there. And when you're able to see the good qualities in people around you, you're able to remember the, good, the big picture, you will not get upset so easily. You will have more metta towards them. Uh, treat them well uh, by body and by speech. Do little acts of kindness, yeah? Uh, 
And uh, it's so wonderful. I, people do so many acts of kindness to me, uh, but do it to each other as well. Uh, because then you get this beautiful harmony when that happens. Uh. And then uh, you take it further. You take it also into your mental world. Uh, you don't allow yourself to have bad thoughts about these good people around you. Again, you remember the big picture. Uh, you remember what truly matters. These are people who really intend well, who want to do what is good in the world. Uh, and train in this again and again and again. And as you train in this again and again and again, gradually your mind will shift and you will start to be able to do this. Uh, yeah? You will actually be able to have good Meta feelings for the people around you pretty much all the time as you train in this way. Yeah. So this is not this this can be done. It's just that our habits tend to go counter to this. So you have to change your habits, change the way you usually reflect, and by using your mind skillfully in this way, one day uh, you will generally have good feelings to the people around you. I know it works because I've been doing this, trying to live like this for many, many years. Uh, and uh, there's no doubt that I, I have changed enormously because of that. Uh, yeah, I'm very glad. Nobody, what is the longest that I know anyone here? Not that many years, only a few years. Uh, whew, I'm very, very glad about that because uh, if you had known me a long time ago, you may have thought I was a hopeless monk. Yeah, this fellow, no chance that he will do anything good in this life. Uh, but so now you see me after a long time, I'm already kind of a, a product on the way, yeah? So a little bit kind of, I'm already kind of come a certain way down the assembly line, uh, yeah? And I'm kind of moving towards the exit, hopefully, of the assembly line. Uh. So Ajahn Brahm's factory, monk factory, that's what I, I'm part of. Uh. So please do this, yeah? And when you live like this, uh, you are creating harmony in the uh, Buddhist Gem Fellowship, but not only that, what you're also doing is that you are creating the foundations for meditation practice. And maybe you don't have to experience so much pain in meditation anymore because of that. Yes, yeah, so maybe you can go more directly to the bliss, directly to the happiness, because you are more purified inside. And it's nice, yeah? there's no need to, if we can avoid the pain, we do that. If you feel that a bit of pain is helpful in a meditation, please do so, but if you can avoid it, even better, I would say. Uh, and go straight to the happiness, straight to the samadhi, and bang. This is how you do it, by purifying your mind in this way. Uh. So, uh, beautiful little teachings that you find, hidden away in little places like this. Uh. And uh, then, uh, the Venerable Nandia and the Venerable Kimbala each spoke likewise, adding, that is how, Venerable Sir, we are living in concord, with mutual appreciation, without disputing, blending like milk and water, viewing each other with kindly eyes. Good, good, Anuruddha. I hope that you all abide diligent, ardent and resolute. Surely, Venerable Sir, we abide diligent, ardent and resolute. But Anuruddha, how do you abide thus? So, um, uh, first of all, they live in concord, that's the first thing. And the next one is how to live ardent and resolute. Yeah? And this is how he talks about living ardent and resolute. Uh, and what he says is the following, Venerable Sir, as to that, whichever of us returns first from the village with alms food, prepares the seed, sets out the water for drinking and for washing, and puts the refuse bucket in its place. Whichever of us returns last, uh, eats, any food left over, if he wishes, otherwise he throws it away where there is no greenery, or drops it into water where there is no life. He puts away the seeds and the water for drinking and for washing. He puts away the refuse bucket after washing it, and he sweeps out the refectory. Whoever notices that the pots of water for drinking, washing, and the latrine are low or empty, takes care of them. If they are too heavy for him, he calls someone else by a signal of the hand, and they move it by joining hands. But because of this, we do not break out into speech. But every five days we sit together all night discussing the Dhamma. That is how we abide diligent, ardent, and resolute. And uh, it's a little bit strange because it's all about the practicalities of daily life and not so much about the Dhamma practice. But I think you can take it as given that uh, part of this is also the meditation practice. Yeah? If you live the rest of your life in the right way, then the meditation kind of comes naturally into that, becomes part of that. Uh, so we can assume here that, uh, that uh, 
the meditation is part of this, and that is really what the next part is about. Uh, good, good Anuruddha, but while you abide thus diligent or heedful, uh, ardent and resolute, have you attained any superhuman qualities? Uh, and a distinction in knowledge and vision worthy of the noble ones, uh, a comfortable abiding. Uh. First of all, these things, what are they? And these things really are jhana states, yeah? These are what the, is meant by this. And also, of course, the noble states of uh, uh, the four stages of awakening. That's really what comes under these uh, superhuman qualities and comfortable abidings and all of this. Uh. So that is what he is referring to. Uh. And uh, uh, he replies, he replies, Venerable Sir, as we abide here, diligent, ardent and resolute, uh, we perceive both light and a vision of forms. Uh, soon afterwards the light and the vision of forms disappears, uh, but we have not discovered the cause for that. And then the Buddha replies, you should discover the cause for that, Anuruddha. Yeah? Let me stop there. We have we're kind of going a little bit on overtime now, but uh, let me just very briefly explain what is going on here. So they are meditating, and when they meditate, they see lights and visions of forms uh, yeah, in the meditation practice. Uh, that is what they're saying, and that is what they call superhuman qualities here. It's not the full superhuman quality of jhana or insight yet, uh, but it is kind of in that direction, heading in that way. This is what is meant by this. Uh, so, um, what are these things? And lights and visions of forms, this is really, I think, and uh, these are similar to what we now call samadhi nimittas in the present day. Uh, because a samadhi nimitta is, uh, uh, you know, the way it is used in common uh, language in the Buddhist world is often this light that you have in mind. And that light will have a certain form, yeah? And that is uh, normally what is what would, would be meant by these things. It could also mean forms, it could also mean any kind of vision that you have in samadhi. These are often also called nimittas in the present day, nimittas. Uh, uh, so it could also be refer referring to that. But in this case, I think it is very likely to refer to the sa uh, samadhi nimitta. And the reason for that is because the uh, sutta goes on. It shows how to uh, sustain that light and the vision of the forms and then take it into the jhana states down the track. Yeah. So uh, the Buddha gives then this beautiful explanation. I'm not going to go into that. I'll probably stop there and go on to the next sutta next time. But the, good, the Buddha gives a very beautiful explanation here how to uh, uh, sustain, how to d discover the causes why that vision disappears. Yes, in other words, how to sustain the meditation practice, how to find the refined defilements that stop you from going all the way into the jhanas. And this is what this whole sutta is about. And the Buddha basically uh, recalls his own practice and how he dealt with these things uh, when he was on his way to awakening. Uh, uh, and that is what comes after this. But if you wish to have a look at that, uh, I will encourage you to have a look at that uh, by yourself uh, because I will... Uh, uh, I'm going to stop uh, stop at this particular point, and the next time around, I'll probably move on to the next sutta. So that is all for now. So uh, let's have some uh, refreshments uh, and a cup of tea or whatever you like, uh, and we'll see you back in here again around quarter past quarter past four. Uh. Okay. <coughs>